Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of When the Cleats Come Off. I told you she would come back and I didn't realize how fast it would be, but Tori Vidalis is back to talk about first base and hitting today. Back. My cleats are off. I'm rocking the Crocs today. <laughs> so we're, we're in it. We're in it for the long haul. <laughs> yes. I'm kind of glad you mentioned that because I hope that the title, it truly, it doesn't mean like when you retire, what happens next? A lot of people right. think that's what it is. No, it's when the cleats are off. How are you? Um, setting yourself up for success outside the white lines. How are you yeah. working on your mental game? How are you learning more about the game? So, and even more important, like who are you without the ball? Exactly. Who are you without the white lines, like that's I think that's how I interpret it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, and we we dove into that last time. We talked a little bit about like having an identity other than just softball. Mm-hmm. Um, it helps with probably your just longevity in the game because if you're eat, breathe, live only softball, it's boring. Yeah. yeah. I mean, unless you're like someone like Sam Fisher who lives <laughs> and dies softball. That's true. I think it's important to have something that you care about, like outside of the game, whether it be like a person, a, a hobby, a place. Yeah. Just to, like, give you that refresh of like, oh my gosh, I, I love this game a lot because mm-hmm. you know what they say, distance makes the heart grow fonder. And I think that's true. Exactly. And Sam has a dog, so it's not like she has no friends <laughs> like outside of softball. <laughs> but yeah so the sam is like great at like she has so many contacts within the softball world and it seems like every time i check in with her or because her and i are on the the player executive committee for au together as well Mm -hmm. she's always like getting front toss with somebody because she lives near arizona state so she'll be there like getting front toss getting bp hanging out with chitty like you know she's always just in softball and i love that for her because that's what makes her heart smile so yep more power to you girl exactly she does her thing and we love her for it she's been on the podcast before she talked about hitting too so i just love getting different perspectives from different people like because your hitting approach is probably different than sam's oh sam always talks about the rise ball (laughs) yeah i mean but that's the thing is we have so many people that you know play pro are successful in college and everybody's swing is different Mm -hmm. and every like cue that they give themselves is different so why not like listen and learn from multiple people and find the one that works the best for you you know you could be cheating yourself out of some really great hits or really great mentality if you're only listening to one person you got to diversify find what works for you and then you put it into action you know yeah yeah because that's the thing too it's like you know, when people listen, like, I hope that people can resonate with each hitter, like in certain ways, but like not all of them, because you're building, like you said, like your own swing and your own identity. So picking just a little bit from each of the greats, you know, can make you the great that, that makes you stand out. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be anything that you copy either. It could be something that I say that triggers like, Oh, that I didn't think about it that way. What if I tried to do it this way? Mm-hmm. And then boom, it just clicks. It's my favorite part is like, everyone is so different that not what is what makes us good. Yeah. I love it here. Okay. So we will get to hitting, but I promised first baseman, they would get some love too. And yes. so you played third and first, but I have a feeling you just really love first base. Like <laughs> you, you always look like you're having a ball out there. Yeah. I mean, so the journey to first base was actually very long. Um, First base was the only position on the field other than like catcher that I did not play growing up. I was yeah. raised as a shortstop. And I know everyone says that you know, I'm a shortstop. I like to say that I was raised as a shortstop, but in reality, I was raised as an athlete. Like we wanted to be able to play any position, help the team out in any way that we could. I actually was going through pictures. They're right beside me here and it would take me too long to find it. But there was a picture of my very first select ball team or my travel team people always make fun of me because I say select I'm from Texas that's what we do but um of me in the outfield and I remember I was the youngest one on the team I was the smallest but I was also the fastest I know a lot of things have changed since then but I was a center fielder and they stuck me out there because you know they thought oh well you know we won't need her like no one's really gonna hit the ball out there and you know we'll just it'll be easy like it'll be fine well, turns out a lot of balls actually ended up coming out there. 
And I caught every single one of them. And my mom said, you were just like running around like all of the grass and catching everything you could. You never let anything touch the ground. And that was like truly the first like time I felt really like, oh my gosh, I could do this for a long time. This is so much fun. And then as I grew up, you know, I played mostly shortstop, but I played for Impact Gold in, in high school for my travel team. And we would do this thing in the fall where we would switch. So we would rotate every two innings. The first baseman would stay um, because it's a very specialized position, but third, short, and second would all just rotate in a circle. So every game wow. would get to play third, second, and short. And so that was a way to kind of just like get our juices flowing. Like, okay, what do we do in this situation? And we're constantly having to work our minds because this was kind of when the, the, um, exposure tournaments were coming out and like people were like oh well we don't have to win I just have to play well but we really were focused on like we didn't really care about winning we we focused on how do we make every single game and use it to our advantage we can switch positions make our brains think a little bit harder and I really do think that that gave us a better IQ in the softball world absolutely now you know what everybody's doing and that allows you to have more communication within that infield. And so um, we talked a little bit about college and coach Evans last time on part one. And whenever I committed, you know, I was having these conversations with my uh, select coach, with coach Evans. And like, you know, they were speaking of course, and saying, where do you see her in your lineup? Like, where do you see her on the field? Should we be training for something specific? And she said, you know, I really see her being a, a great asset for us at third base. And I'm like, boom, sign sealed, delivered. Like it was never a, but I want to play shortstop or I want to play second base. Like I want to play this position. My thing going in was I want to play, I want to start and I want to make an impact, whether that be on the field or off the field. And I knew that that was going to be my goal. So she said third base. I said, coach, it's done. I'm, I'm a third baseman now. Like I will tell everyone. <laughs> I am a third baseman. Yeah. So I played there my first year. Third, third was like a comfortable position for me, but it wasn't something that I was like, I'm the best third baseman in this nation. You know, like I wasn't like, nobody's bunting on me. Nobody's, you know, so I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. I was athletic, but I didn't feel like it was my true calling. Mm -hmm. And so I did play there one year, you know, come back, expect to kind of like fall back into that starting spot at third base and we get to fall practice. We had a great freshman class that came in and one of those freshmen was Riley Sarton. Mm. Had a baby, by the way, love her, all my <laughs> wishes, Riley and Noah and baby Reese, but so fun for um, them. Me too. And uh, so she came in and let me tell you, Riley is one of like the greatest defenders I've ever had the pleasure of like playing with or watching. Mm -hmm. um, just so smooth, great footwork, you know, all of these things. And it started to look like, you know, she was going to be our starting third baseman. And I never once was like, oh my gosh, she's going to start at third. Where am I going to play? Like, I can't even remember a moment that that happened because I had a conversation with coach Evans and she said, you know, on top of third, let's, well, our, we have a spot open at first. Like let's work you in over there and see how you do. And so you can learn it a little bit, learn the nuances, learn footwork. And I'm like, okay, like no problem. So I'm doing both. I'm doing double time in practice. I'm like running and a girl was tired. <laughs> that was a lot of cardio. Imagine bunts practicing bunts. I know the outfielders are dying normally, but like as a first baseman, I'm literally just running up, running back, up, running up, running back because no one ever bunts to us in the bunting drills. It's like mm -hmm. they have to be very strategic about where they place that bunt. And unless they're very strategic, it normally doesn't go to me. So I'm just doing wind sprints the whole yeah. time. I, am, I get that. Girl, and then you got to go back around the third base and you got to run up, you got to run back. I was like, girl, I am tired. That's probably why I was in such good shape, but Anyways, um, so the time comes, we get a little bit closer and Coach Evans says, you know, I, I really think the best thing for our team would be for Riley to play third base and for you to slide over to first base. Like, how do you feel about that? And I said, Coach, I'm here literally to, to make us better. I want to go to the World Series. I want to win a national championship. I want to do all of these things I'm in. Like, it didn't take much convincing, nothing. And 
the more and more that I practiced over there and I had a lot of help from my teammates at the time who had been playing first, you know, Bree Dozier was one that helped me a ton of just, you know, footwork, finding the right timing of releasing and um, keeping your eye on the field, but also knowing exactly how far you are from the base. And there's all these yeah. little things that people don't notice, but I will say the number one thing I learned about first base was people don't notice you doing your job until you don't do it right. Yep because you this the shortstop could make this diving play on their knees like sidearm and it hits the dirt but if you catch it everyone's like oh my god sports center top 10 all of these things but if you miss that ball it's like ah Mm -hmm. so close yeah like it took away from what they did so like at the end of the day the first baseman truly is the difference if they have a shot at catching that ball of course but we are the difference between a top 10 play and just a play that could have been mm-hmm. and, and catcher. You're not expected to get left yes, first base and catcher are two, Cause like the first baseman is technically the catcher of the outfield. Mm-hmm. And those are the two positions that I feel really don't ever get as much love as they should, because it's such a demanding job, but it's not very rewarding in the sense of like people praising you and people being like, Oh my gosh, she's such a good first baseman. So anyways, back to getting over to first base. So I ended up playing first base. The one thing I will say about first is I feel like people kind of put me in this box once I went to first base and they said, oh, well, she can only play first base. Right. And um, as someone who grew up, like being very agile, like as I got older, I wasn't fast by any means, but I was very agile and quick side to side whereas first base is more front to back. And so I felt like I was almost wasting a little bit of my athleticism because I was more steady in the position that I was in of Mm -hmm. like, I'm only two or three steps away from the base. My only job really is to make my other infielders look good. And that was what I was concerned with. And so I, I didn't get as much chance to, to, you know, make the diving plays, make the the snags down the line, because there are those opportunities at first, but they're very far and few in between. So you have Mm -hmm. a less, you have a smaller room for error because you only get maybe one, two balls like every weekend in college, or at least that's what it seems like. There will always be that one game where you get like six or seven and you're like, what is happening? Um, But yeah, so I moved over to first and ever since then, like I've been there every single day and I actually got to play a little bit of right field, show off my skills in AU, but yeah, it's, I, I love first base. I love that I'm categorized as that. And I wish more people knew how much work it was to make everyone look good. Yeah. So I had a very similar experience. I was like the shortstop growing up. I played a ton of outfield and travel ball. Um, and I've shared this before, but I was asked to be our second baseman my freshman year. And I'm like, wow, that's new. So kind of like you, I'm like, okay, like I will. And I was actually doing the same thing as you. I was doing outfield and second base. And you know how, like when the outfield has off, that's when the infield works. Girl didn't get a break. So like, I feel you on that one. And second is just running. It's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. But, um, so I played that for two years and then I was shifted to first in my junior year. Mm. And like you, I had no real experience at first. I think I played it once in travel ball. Um, and like you, I was, I was raised an athlete. I was raised to chase down balls and go all out and dive and everything. Um, so I, I really understand that to a T. Um, but I did realize, you know, that winter between like between my sophomore and junior year, I spent so much time at first and it took a lot of work in order to like, look okay at first, like it takes way more work than people think. And even if you are the star athlete and you're moved to first, it is a whole nother ball game. It like is. the pressure but of like, if you drop it, like oh. that could be the difference between the game and in your, in your, you know, even fielding the bunt and having to turn your body fully to first and like make the throw. You're not used to that. Like, yeah. And um, people think it's like one of those positions that's not very athletic, but yeah. to make first base look easy 
you have to have so much coordination because your feet are moving so often in such a small like area where, you know, shortstop and second base, they have pretty much the whole backside of the field of the infield. But as like a first baseman, you can't get too far away from your base. So you're kind of like stuck in this one spot and you have to like make it look all nice with your, with your, your uh, feet. Yeah. Your footwork has but to be you on can point. Tell yeah. When someone is just like a hitter and they want their bat in the lineup and they just throw them in at first. Yeah. And you know what gets me is when they put them at first base without a first baseman. That's yeah. what really gets me. Cause I'm like, you're not doing justice to this position. Would you go catch with a regular glove? No. No, you wouldn't break your hand. Do that. And it's like, it makes me so mad. And I know there's some situations where like, you know, there's injuries and someone doesn't have a first baseman or like, maybe they're not there. And I get that. But like, if you're at first base for an extended period of time and you're using a freaking 12 and 12 glove or 11 and three quarter glove at first base, I can't next. You're going to miss everything. How did you feel when you got your first first baseman? (laughs) because I remember I was like, I can catch anything. Like Girl, I was running around. I had it on my head. I'm like, Oh my God, guys, I'm never missing a ball. Like my head fits inside my glove going from, I think I used 11 and a quarter when I was at that third base. Okay. So very tiny yeah, all the way to a 13 inch. So I felt like I had flipper on my hand. <laughs> Like I was just swatting the ball and it's almost so heavy that your shoulder gets sore because yeah, yeah. going from that light glove, um, the very aerodynamic, your hand, your hand is working so much harder to squeeze too. From having to squeeze. So I've always done two in the pinky and like, it makes it a lot easier for me. So you hold it yeah. like this way. I, I hold it like this. So like, so you are so, pinky. What I do is I do like this, instead of having one in the pinky where your finger, like this is going to be the most squeeze. I Mm -hmm. just move these together and then this shifts over. So there's like a hole right here. Yeah. For people that are like freaking out because you can't see your hand. If you go to YouTube and you're really concerned about this, like, or want to see it, you can go to YouTube and watch this. Um, But actually now that I think about it, I like almost broke my hand, my junior year, my thumb, which is why I had to shift. And I ended up closing Ah. more with like four fingers. Yep. Obviously took some adjusting, but before we go too far into gloves, um, but <laughs> we love having these massive gloves cause we can scoop things, but the problem is adjusting to the glove takes some work, right? Yeah. Like having to figure out like, what's your pocket, how are you going to, you know, pick up that short hop? Mm. Um, I kind of want to get into the details of first and like the intricacies that, that nobody yeah. talks about. For sure. Um, first one being stretching. Okay. Mm. So you wear your glove on your left hand, correct? Do Yes. Okay. So do you put your, when you turn towards the infield, is your right ball of your foot on the corner of first base? Yes. So I think the first thing that I always am aware of when I'm at first is how far I am away from the bag, because that's going to dictate, you know, when I need to release and how much time I have to get back to the base when yes. there's like a slapper up or compared to a power hitter, you're going to be playing a little bit further back. Um, so knowing where I'm at and then whenever the ball is hit and I know that's not hits me, I'm releasing towards the field mm-hmm. to kind of like scan the field where the ball's going, what position I think that they're going to end up in. Cause softball is just a lot of, um, anticipation yeah. of like, okay, what is this ball doing if it's spinning this way and it's going this way, where is it going to take my defender? Um, so say it's taking, you know, shortstop deep in the five, six hole. And I know that they're going to have to make a backhand play and probably throw the ball on the ground to get it there faster. And this is a pro mm-hmm. tip. If you're first baseman and you see a ball going deep, deep in a hole away from you, always like talk to your, you know, second baseman shortstop and be like, when that happens, throw the ball in the dirt. Because Mm -hmm. as a first baseman, that's your job, one, to pick the ball. But two, the ball gets to you faster on the ground than it does in the air. Because it has something to kind of roll off of uh, compared to a ball just like flying through the air. It's a lot slower. So when you throw that ball on the ground, um, I always make sure. So if the the base that's facing second base is right here, I'm going to have my, the ball of my foot, my right foot back on the base. 
depending on where the ball is at is where my foot goes. Mm. So if I know that the third baseman is a little bit more up towards the plate, I will put my front or my, my toe, my ball of my foot on more, more the front side of the bag. So it would be like closer to the corner that's pointing at third. Yeah. Whereas if it was a ball that was deep in the, in the three, four hole and my second baseman made a a diving stop and is going to throw it, I'm going to be all the way faced at her. And my foot is going to be on the backside of that same angle of the base and I'm going to be facing her. So you want to just put yourself in the best position of where the ball is and where the defender is. Because Mm -hmm. if you're in the same place that you would be for a five, six hole ball and a three, four hole ball, then that could be the difference in safer out. You can lose a foot. Yeah. You lose so much. It's like basically the way people say, like you hit the front part of the bag when you're running through first compared Mm -hmm. to the backside you're losing those tiny little milliseconds that really do end up being game changer in a safer alcohol. And it could cost you the game. Yeah, totally. Okay. So I'm glad you mentioned when you turn, you always try to turn towards the field. Um, I think that's something that's not really that it's not taught that much. Um, and I think, and that's obviously important because like you said, you still have like your, your eyes aren't set on a certain point, but you can still kind of have an idea what's going on from the corner of your eye if you turn towards the field. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people also, sorry to interrupt, but, um, another people, people always say like, keep your eye on the field at all times, but I'm going to say this. I want people to take, take it with a grain of salt. Okay. So when you do turn, it's important that you turn towards the field. So you get a view of what's happening, but also it is okay to take your eye off of like the play that's happening mm -hmm. for like a quick millisecond to make sure you're to find the corner is yeah. right on the base. And I know so many people are like, oh, well, I can't take my eye off the ball. But then you're standing and you're kind of like trying to search for the bag with your back foot. And you never want to be in a situation where the ball is in your hand and your foot's not on the bag, like yep. purposely, like a good throw. Mm-hmm. So what I do is the ball's hit, I'm turning, evaluating where the play is, which way is the ball taking people. And immediately if my eyes are going down to the bag mm-hmm. to find which part of the bag I'm going to be on. And honestly, if it's like a quick play, I'm just trying to find the bag. Like, I don't care where my foot's at as long as it's on the corner um, or that edge. And immediately, as soon as I see it, I get my foot in position and I'm like in an athletic stance waiting for the ball so that I can adjust any way I need to. And that's where that corner comes in handy again, because say your third baseman is really, um, really far back. So I'm going to be on that front part of the base pointing towards third base and say she makes a throw that's way wide right I mean I have to move my foot back so the in play adjustments that you can make with your footing is very important as well so if I start I'm going to try to do this (laughs) for those of you listening I'm so sorry um okay so your right foot is back on the bag right your third baseman throws something wide over here so back towards right field immediately I'm going to try to switch my feet and almost square up to my third baseman and go up or go to the side. If it's more out this way, you want to keep that right foot on the bag because you can get a further stretch. But if it's something that's like higher or anything like that, I try to go up on my left foot and reach with my right arm. I mean, my left arm, excuse me, forgot which hand. So you push, hang on, you push with your right foot and then reach with your left so I yeah. keep like if there's a ball that's high I always come back to center not me trying to get up and do a demo um <laughs> I should so say this right <laughs> I um I come back to the base so I have both feet on the base yes and really it's whatever foot is most comfortable for you but I always tend to go up on my left so my right foot is coming up in the air and if you're catching it would interesting. be interesting so, okay. I did the, I did, the, I did the opposite. Like if, we, if there's a high ball coming because my right foot's already on the bag, I would try to find more of the top of it. Cause it's more springy there, mm. but then I would have, I would push down with my right and then reach with my left because I felt like I can get on my tiptoes and get further, but honestly, it might be the exact same. I don't know. 
I think I do both. I think it just depends, but yeah, it is okay everything depends on, yeah. That's the key is like, it's okay to move during a play to put yourself in a good position. So I think that's a good thing to like learn is like, okay, how, how far can I stretch with this leg out? And like, where does my arm go when I do this? Or like, if there's a high throw, like what does my body tend to do? And that way you have a better understanding of like, okay, how do I get myself in the right position and the right timing and the right stretch or length of your body to get to that ball? Yeah. I would encourage coaches, especially listening, like have your first baseman play around with it, especially if they're new, yeah. like have them try different things. Like Tori and I do two different things on that one play. Um, mm-hmm. but they work for us cause we're comfortable there. I think yeah. where people get stuck is they don't, they don't practice all of the X, Y, Z plays like cis Bates doesn't make these diving plays without having practiced it or trying oh, it out. 100%. So, um, must've been fun receiving her a few times in AU. Oh yeah. She always gives me like the like perfect little short hop and I'm like, yeah. yes, she but- bounces a ton of balls to first. Like, yeah. And like I said, the balls get there faster sometimes. And like, they're probably the easier ground. to read for you too. If they're hitting yeah, the ground very early specific, enough, like spin off of her ball. So that's the thing as like a first baseman is you're always watching and always like observing. And that's one of the things for me is that I'm always watching and figuring out is like, what do these players arms do in different situations mm-hmm. and how does that affect their spin on the ball? Right. So sis doesn't have like this crazy strong arm, but she's very accurate. So she's going to throw like even out of a sidearm, she has a very true spin. So I know that when it comes out, it's going to be very true. And wherever it's bouncing, it's going to bounce and do like a forward spin. So I know that as soon as that ball hits on the short hop, I can just pick it just like this and it's not going to pop out of my glove. So I don't have to do anything extra Mm -hmm. to like try to keep that ball in. Um, But different players, like I remember at A&M, we would do this drill that was really fun for everyone else. And it was really hard for me because it was a lot of thinking is coach Evans would just throw balls on the infield, like everywhere, just literally have a heyday, throw it everywhere. And each player takes turns and it's like the whole entire team. It's not just the infield. And they're just um, going up to the ball, basically doing like a three-step approach and then grabbing the ball and just like, as fast as they can throwing it. So it could be a good throw. It could be a bad throw. It could be like a wide throw, a wobbly throw, whatever you want it to be. And not only is it fun for like the girls that aren't receiving, but for me, that's like the only one-on-one time that I get as a first baseman with the whole team contributing to that drill that's specific for me. So I love that one because you get to see different people's arm angles and like when they're joking around, it's going to be a little bit more chaotic than it would normally be in a game. But I think that actually helps because you can see what's it like when they try to throw it like into the ground, they try to spike it or when they're like trying to throw sidearm, what does that do with their ball? And it is a lot of thinking and a lot of cardio because you're there. And as soon as you get to your position, you release, and then they're going to do their three-step and you're catching it and you're going back. So it's like over and over and over again. And we did, I think like two or three buckets of Mm. balls. So I just got to see all types of arm angles and spin and break and all of these cool things. That's a really cool drill. And thank you for mentioning how every, every defender is going to have a different release point, different type of throw. I remember I had a third baseman, her ball tailed towards the line. Um, Mm. so I used to stretch out and then her ball would like continue to go towards, and then I'd find myself reaching. (sighs) Yeah. So there was actually a time where I had to get off the bag to catch it. So I wouldn't break my arm off and then tag the runner. Mm. I don't know how I did that. Um, but yeah, her balls just sailed towards hers. And I will say, I definitely had to have a conversation with her about it because it was getting to the point where like, there's a risk here. Um, for my arm, <laughs> but, um, that's where we kind of both agreed, like, Hey, start your ball more left. So when it tails towards the first baseline, it's more centered. And then I could actually time my stretch so that I'm at a full stretch when I need to be. So that's, yeah. that's the next question I want to ask you, when should you start your stretch? Because I know so many first basemen, they start their stretch early, just like I was mentioning. And then you find yourself not being able to extend towards the ball because it's tailing or it's falling to the ground. So like, when do you start your stretch? Um, can you give us a ballpark for that? 
yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up because there's a few things like I want to incorporate with this as well um, that you mentioned. But um, so stretching is essential to first base, of course, but stretching the right way will 100% improve the way you look and the way you perform at first base. So mm-hmm. um, like we were talking about with the throws, you have to like see the throw before you stretch. So you have to see the throw and see where that ball's going to be. It's almost like if you were hitting, when is your front foot going to be down, right? You would hope it's down like as, before you turn. Like, <laughs> as the pitch is coming and your heel, your front heel should go down about halfway, like as you're transferring that weight, should go down about when that ball is halfway home. And that's where you kind of know like, okay, my swing's there. I'm on time. I'm on plane. It's the same thing with receiving. So if you stretch out for a ball that you don't read the spin on, or if you're just kind of like in not in the right position and say that ball takes like a nice little stream of whatever it has on it and jumps up and you're already stretching out towards the ball. It's so hard to go out and then go up to try Mm -hmm. to find that ball. So what I do is this was a trick I learned um, when we did like visual things in college, we worked with this company and they came in and they taught us about vision and how to like trick your brain. So I like to do this when I can't see the ball very well. I stare at their middle of their forehead because they're releasing right here. It's easier for your brain to pick up the seams a little bit faster because you're not focused on the ball the whole time. So it's almost like if you stare for so long, you know how things get a little blurry, your your eyes start to cross, obviously it's a little exaggerated, but you stare at the, the center of their forehead and right as they go to release, you switch your vision to the ball. So it's okay. almost giving your, your eyes like a jolt of energy to see just a little bit better, to recognize that spin a little bit earlier. And um, I started like stretching weird whenever I first started because I thought that I had to go get the ball when in reality, I'm letting the ball come to me and meeting it at our like perfect point. So your stretch, first of all, should be with one hand. Don't ever stretch with two hands because you're taking away length from your shoulder and from your arm and your ball getting, or the glove getting to the ball. And the second thing is don't stretch until the ball's halfway to you. So you should be able to identify where that ball's going and where it's at. And if you're in the right position for it. So when you stretch, you should go up and like back to your point about like balls going into the, or up the line. It's so important as a first baseman to know when, when you can finish that play successfully and when you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it is important that we start the conversation about the safety bag everywhere, softball, all year, everything, because it is so dangerous um, for girls, especially that aren't as developed and that don't have that level of IQ in the game yet to know, like, can I catch this and tag her and get my arm out of the way? Or am I going to blow out my UCL right here? So as a first baseman, like you mentioned, your third baseman was throwing the ball up the line. Well, uh, Riley would sometimes do that to me. And I'm like, Hey, if I let this ball go, it's because I'm going to get hurt. And, and we all knew that if I let that ball go, like, It could be the national championship game, but I'm not, it's not worth someone getting hurt to make this play when I can let this go. If everyone's in the right spot for their backups, like I would much rather do that than hurt myself. And I think everyone should realize like, it is up to you to make that decision, literally bang, bang decision to realize, okay, where's the runner? Where's the ball? do I have time? Like, is she far enough away that I can catch this ball, bring my arm in close to my body? Cause if your arm is straight out like this, they run into your arm, you're done. Yeah. Done for. So you want to ideally, if it's far enough off, like up the line, I like to kind of pull my body closer to the ball up the line off the bag. The bag no longer matters. I'm trying to catch the ball, bring my arm in a little bit closer to my body. So I have more support and make the tag preferably with two hands. Yeah. If you have time, if not, one is fine. So you're making the catch in fair territory. 
Yes. Like, so, so you're stopping it before it hits that line, basically. Yes. Because then the you're making the back, you let it travel. The more inclined an accident is to you're happen. Gonna collide. Yep. They're coming at you and you're going into their path. They can't yeah. stop on a dime. I know. So yeah. So you have to be able to maneuver your body to keep yourself safe. Yes. And if there is a situation where you feel like that, ball, that ball is going to take you too far up the line or too far out, like into their path, just let it go. Your mm -hmm. right fielder should be in position. It is not worth like risking surgery for a UCL that's out of place. All the PT that comes with that, it is just not worth an injury of any kind. Absolutely. And we'll reiterate one more time about the safety bag. Like yes. there's a reason why it's being adopted. Is it in 2023 for college or are they still debating? We hope. Yeah. I'm not sure if they've made an official Cause decision. I, would, I thought like, it looked like Texas or somebody added the bag. Somebody added it. Hmm. I don't know, but it, it's only going to help. Like yeah, they Especially have it in the younger ones. Yeah. And they have it in, um, I, I can't think of the word in, um, not pro ball, but universal international. international ball. Yes. They have it in international. They've had it in international forever. Yeah. Um, it needs to start being adopted. It should. It yeah. definitely will save a lot of, of injuries. It would save just a lot of like unnecessary things that could happen from happening. Yeah. I think it teaches you at a young age, like where your running lane is as well. Mm -hmm. so if you're a hitter and you're staying on that outside lane, then you're not going to run into fair territory and like run into somebody. Yeah. You know, there's so many weird, like accidents that can happen in softball that can be avoidable but sometimes you know it just it is what it is it's a yeah sport I've been accidentally yeah. stepped on multiple times on my heel Oof. even even while being on the corner like I didn't have to learn the hard way my coach told me from the beginning like you're only touching the corner you're only touching the corner and I always touch the corner and sometimes I still got stepped on because I'd have maybe a slapper that like is like they go so far up the line like towards the pitcher yep. that like their line is now my heel and I was intentionally stepped on once, but that's a whole nother story. But, oh, um, having some words, if I got intentional, oh, I will tell you <laughs> that. Some words. Game. But that's the yeah, thing. Was, it did I not end there so fast that like that happened to me in super regionals 2017 at Tennessee. And I remember Maddie Shipman was the first base coach. Mm. And she said, did she just step on your foot? And I was like, yeah, like, it's fine. It's just a slapper. She's like, I'll make sure that doesn't happen again. And I was like, <sighs> Yeah, take care of me then See, taking care of the game friends i'm like period that's my girl yeah you call games together um no that's that's a really good point um one thing that i know a lot of first basemen struggle with which i did at first um pun intended was trying to decide how far right i could go so knowing the range of my second baseman oh, that yeah. took a lot of practicing and adjusting which balls can i go for which balls can't I go for? I remember mm -hmm. specifically like hard, hard hits that are like in that three, four hole that like neither of us, like it's going to be tough for either of us to get to. I would always at least try to dive for. Um, but like, obviously I need to make sure I don't dive for something that my second baseman easily gets to, and I can't get back and ca make a catch. So did you do any drills regarding that? How did you develop that? Cause I think that's like a big one and we'll end with this with first base. Um, that a lot of first basemen, especially early on struggle with? Yeah. I think the best thing is just learning your, your teammate, you know, like make sure you're doing range balls to see what their range is. Like how often are they getting to this ball? How often am I, am I getting pulled off of the base? And I mean, a lot of times it's just realizing like what your range is as a defender, like I know that if my forehand is not as strong as my backhand, I'm going to stay a little bit closer to the line mm -hmm. and vice versa. Like if you have a better forehand and good reaction time to your left, then maybe you can play a little bit more off the line. Personally, I don't like to play too far from the line because you never know when that ball down the line, like obviously there's no way for you to even catch it, but at least I can give myself a little bit more of a a head start on those balls down the line. But um, for me, like as a first baseman, my rule is like, if I take two steps and I'm not close, or I know that I would have to make an extra effort to go get it, then I'm just going to let my second baseman have it because I don't want to put myself out of position 
by trying to go for a ball that for me would be a, a spectacular play compared to a second baseman just being a routine ground ball standing up right yep and so one it saves time because now I'm not diving on the floor I can get back to my base and it can be an easy simple we're out of the inning whatever type play or it could be me diving to make this catch it going off my glove which you don't plan for that to happen but sometimes it does or me on my belly ball in my glove no one at first or like second baseman's too late to get to first because not only do you have to dive you have to get up off of your knees turn your body back behind you so it makes it way more complicated as a first baseman to be diving now that's not to say you can't ever dive but like if there's a ball in the air like a line drive go for it lay out why not like i mean somebody will be there hopefully but I do love what they do in baseball. I wish we had enough time for it is that if a first baseman gets pulled, the pitcher will also come for back. Right. Yeah. Our like, game's just too fast. Unrealistic. Yeah. Yep. It's way too fast. And I wish so bad if there was one thing we would teach, it would be that, but it's just, it just wouldn't work. So my advice would be to stay on your feet and let your second baseman be the one that's, you know, making the play in the three, four hole, because you still have a job to do. Your job is not completed after the ball gets hit. Yours is after they make the play and throw the ball. So yeah. you're the very, you're like the outfield, right? You're the last line of defense. I'm like pretty much the last line of defense to get that out. If the ball's on the ground. Right. I remember our coach used to just like, we'd have our second baseman and then us, and then we, she'd have us start in different positions. Like she'd have, you know, first base start a little bit off the line. Yep. And because, you know, when second base maybe is covering a steal, they're more up, they're more towards second. Yep. Um, so just trying different scenarios, hitting a bunch of balls between you, even hitting them down the line, just to keep, like, keep you on your toes. Like, I think it just requires a lot of reps there, which frankly, we don't get a whole lot of them between us. Um, so a lot of reps between second and first. And also if there's time to have communication, like be loud, right. Yeah. Um, cause some, occasionally you'll get like a slapper that's putting something like kind of choppy towards second Ugh. that you're like, you can easily get to, Yep. um, and again, it takes practice and time, but like, you have to realize how far one. away is your second baseman? Like, should they cover first? Like, and if that's the case, how are you going to let them know that you're getting it? Yeah. Um, and that, that needs to be practiced with that second baseman. That's why it's so important to like in practice, go over these things. Like you're doing range balls, you're doing positioning, you're doing um, slappers and power hitters, you're doing gap to gap hitters, you're doing first and thirds, you're doing a uh, runner on first and a slapper up to bat. Like, you know, you're running through all of these scenarios that when you get in the game, you already know what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You just have to do it probably a little bit quicker than you have to do it in practice. Okay, so essentially always checking in to see where your second baseman is playing. Always, there should be like constant, even at AU, like, every week it switches, but every single time I, that I have a second baseman, like, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to continuously let you know where I'm at. If I'm back, if I'm up, if I'm off, if you need me to give you some, because you're covering second base, like, just let me know where you're at and we can position ourselves with each other instead of against each other, giving them a huge gap mm -hmm. and, or just like, you know, giving them the line. Cause they never hit it down the line. Let's shade over a little bit to our right and prevent them from getting that hit in the three, four hole or up the line. Yeah. I mean, up the middle. Sorry. Yeah, totally. All right. I feel like we covered everything for space. I love it. Other than bunting, but like bunting is, it's like one of those where you just have to see it all the time. Yeah. Like you see it and you get there or you don't. <laughs> right. I mean, you can literally stare at the angle of the bat. Like you had to learn that at third too. I'm sure it's like, yeah. and, and that's third. the thing you don't get a ton of bunts to you, but like, yeah getting good at the first step means seeing it early. So yeah, and like slappers, sometimes it's not even the bat angle. It's just looking at the way that they're like holding themselves. Like, you know, they're trying to be sneaky by bunting. Yeah. But they're like changing the way that they're like stepping in the box. or they're changing the way that their feet are, or like you can just tell, or they look at you or they're sometimes, staring at you. Yeah. Sometimes Check slappers their eyes will, out. Like, try to sneak in a little, I look and I'm, I'm always looking them dead in the eye. So I'm like, I'm looking where you're looking. And if you're yeah. looking at me, I'm looking at you. It's like the little Spider-Man meme again. Cause it's like, you're bunting. Who's bunting. Mm -hmm. You're bunting and I'm about to get you out. <laughs> yes. I love being underestimated at first when people totally. bunt. you're just like, yeah, you don't even know, but yeah, try it again. 
try to get. Yeah. And I think for like a slapper or a lefty too, like, I think I started maybe one and a half steps forward, like nothing crazy, but I wanted to give yeah. myself at least one step. Cause obviously they're fast and you still have to get back. So knowing yeah, your the range last thing you want is a foot race between the slapper <laughs> and you. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Anything else we got to hit on with first? Are we ready to go to hitting? Um, just make your infielders look good. That's the end of the, the end goal at the end of the day. And people will know if you're not doing your job and please catch with one hand, preferably yeah. with the first baseman. Make them look good. You won't get good at picking balls. You won't get good at stretching unless you practice it. So we should devote, especially if you're new to this 10 minutes of practice, at least mm-hmm. just, just work on it. I remember my coach would literally just toss me balls and I would work on my stretch every single time. And there'd be some where I'd catch it and then I'd finish my stretch and be like, oh, okay, I need to stretch sooner. Like you just get used to it over time. And yes, please, for the love of all things amazing, don't feel like you have to do the splits on every. No, I the accidentally time, did it once. The only time you should be doing splits on a stretch is like if, the if you can <laughs> on the ground, like so low, because that's the only way you can get out there and be that low. Like if the ball is at your chest, there's no point of doing the splits. I hate like, people that do the splits and they like, they catch that. it like, three steps early and you're like, why? I'm like, we're not like one, it has to be a close play Two, it has to be low Two, don't stretch into the splits. If, if the ball is mid height, like, let's just be reasonable. And, yeah. And I remember one time I did catch on mid height, but it, we were playing and it was like soaking wet on the field and, you and my cleat just kept going. But it was, it was an extremely close play. So I was trying to gain as much ground as I could towards the, um, the ball. Um, and that girl, like, if you look at the replay, she was clearly safe, but they called her out and I'm like, it was the effort. It was the effort. That's why she was called out. I was like, okay. And nobody (laughs) argued it either. They're like, that looked like it hurt. And I'm like, it did. Um, (laughs) but sometimes you just got to go all out. Okay. The moment we've all been waiting for hitting your baby. I asked you last time, if you like defense or hitting more, you were like hitting for sure. Um, why, why do you love it so much? Everybody has their own reason. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just like such a time where I get to be unapologetically myself and like everything that I am in the softball world is celebrated. You know, I'm strong. I'm smart. I'm methodical. I'm logical. You know, like all of these things that I love to be is celebrated when I step in that box, you know, like I hit the ball like 300 feet and people are praising me. Right. Whereas every other aspect of my life when I was younger, like being strong, being hard headed, you know, being, um, unapologetic was not always celebrated. And that's who I was through and through. Like, I was just like, strong girl like trying to fit in in a world full of girls that did not look like me and I finally felt that adrenaline rush whenever I had my first home run and it was in 10 no either 10 you or 12 you I can't I think I'm pretty sure it was 12 you but I was only 10 years old and I hit the ball and I was like oh my gosh I want to do that for the rest of my life like (laughs) that felt so good I can't wait to like learn more about it and then the next at bat I went out and I struck out and I think it was a moment where I realized like maybe I'm not as good as I (laughs) I am I need to like you know practice a little bit more and understand and so I had a conversation with my dad and he's like if you really want to get into this like I was telling you about how he would quiz me all the time with my brother in the car about defense. Well, sometimes we would talk about it on the other end. We would do it on offense and we would talk about, you know, okay, if she goes um, screw ball in, curve ball out, change up down, where is she going? And like, I would have to give him a reason and like why I thought it would be this specific thing. And he'd be like, okay, well, if you say this, you're still right. If you say this, you're still right. But I want you to figure out like, what is she trying to make you do? Like she's trying to slow you down to speed you back up or she's trying to jam you in. So you freeze on the change up, you know, different things and different um, situations of pitch calling and hitting the mechanics of hitting and then just self-confidence, you know, it takes so much to be a good hitter, not because of the mechanical things, but because of the mindset and how truly just like 
on a mission you have to be because it is so easy to let yourself crumble under all the pressure of a game that is supposed to make you fail and it's so funny because we hear it all the time like this game is a failure you're not supposed to succeed three out of ten blah 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 blah. but like truly this game will test you to many lengths and it has and I've always come out on the other side better for it Mm -hmm. And I think as I grew, I began, began to love hitting even more because it's so complex and it's not as easy as just, you know, success looks like this, you know, it could look a multitude of different ways, but what feels best to me and yeah. who am I going to be that day? Who am I going to show up as we're going to find out, you know, mm -hmm. it definitely keeps you humble. That like your, sure. your home run, then strike out. <clears throat> I'm sure so many people have stories of like, you know, last game, they hit the game winning home run or the game winning hit. And then the next game, they don't get a single hit. Um, it takes a lot of mental fortitude to be able to be like, okay, I did the job. Now I can't live in the high. I have to get back to where I was before I did the thing. Um, yes. this is what like, you know, books like mind gym or heads up baseball. I think you mentioned both of those last time, but, um, there, these are books that to help you like get back to, you know, the even keeled ready to crush it, like mentality. Um, what is your, or what do you think you believe are your strengths as a hitter? Like, like when you go up in the box, this is what Tori is written down to know or to do. Um, so my strengths, I would say I definitely have very fast hands and I can hit any pitch you throw to me. So like if the setup is right, like most times I'm playing a game of chess with myself in my head about what I think they're going to throw, you know, what's their strength, what's their strikeout pitch, what do I hit well, what what did I do the last at bat, you know, what did I do last game, what did I do last week, like especially with AU, it's, it's hard because you get so into like there's so many instances to use as like a sample size that it's hard to continuously play a game of chess that never ends. Um, and it's also, what does the catcher like to call? Cause in AU, you know, we call our own game and in international, we call it our own game. So um, the catchers, what are their um, inclinations? You know, what do they like to do? Do they like to jam you up? Do they like to freeze you with the change? Do they like to make you chase out of the zone? So I would say I have a good sense of, you know, having a plan of like what I want to do, whether it just be, I'm going to see a strike and I'm going to barrel a strike. It could be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be like, all right, I'm going to hit an outside pitch on a two, one count. And, um, I'm going to hit it to right field and I'm going to get a double. Like that is just crazy to me that some people think like that because it works for some people. Like there's people at AU that are like, okay, She's going to go change up in, and then she's going to go curveball out on the river. And I'm going to swing at that pitch. And I'm like, girl, how did your brain just do that? My brain never does that. It, my brain Some people are hurt. just analytical like that. Yes, like, they it's are. Just how they play. It is. And shout out to you if you play. are. Yeah, no, I mean, that's amazing. I wish I could do that because that means you have such a good grasp on the game and the pitcher and all these things and what you want to do. But so my strength is like, keeping it simple. Like I love to just go up there and be like, I'm gonna just hit a ball that's over the plate. And that's all I have to tell myself. It could be a change up, rise ball, screw ball, curve ball, who doesn't matter. As long as it's over the plate, like I'm locked in. And I think that's one of my strengths is that I'm able to just keep things simple and not make it too complicated and trying to make this big, extraordinary thing happen. Just like letting the game come to you, keeping it just like you did when you were 10. Mm -hmm. just you don't even know what a curveball is you're just looking for that ball coming right over the plate yeah you know what's interesting is they have all these apps now where they're like can you identify what the pitch is like early mm -hmm. which I think I naturally figured out over time but like if someone were to if someone were to ask me in that at bat what pitches did you get like what four pitches did you get I, it would, it would be hard for me to tell them yeah, because no. I'll be like, it was high and out. It was yeah. low and in because like, that's how simple I try to make it for myself too. I love that you're the same as me, but again, shout out to those people who like know this stuff early, but right. um, I think it was almost easier to play for me mm, when it was just like, is it in my zone? <laughs> like, or sure. isn't it? 
in, um, is it in this part because of so I'm swinging. Yeah, I'm it, swinging yeah, hard. and obviously, like we train off of these machines that throw rise balls a lot, so we can figure out how to get on top. But like when we can subconsciously know it's going up, we know how to get there because we've trained ourselves to do it. But I, I'm the same as you. I don't like to overthink. I just like to see it and hit it. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me when I find people, and I think I actually used to teach this five years ago when I was a hitting coach was like, Hey, like first pitch only if it's exactly where you want it, should you swing? Right. And like, now I'm thinking, you know, maybe we have one of the four zones that we don't really enjoy. <laughs> like right now, like for me, it was low and out for a long period of time, mm-hmm. but anything like up or down and in, like I'm attacking those. I feel like if we expand our zone earlier, we can be so much more successful instead of getting behind an account where like pitchers are trying to get ahead. Like they're not trying to throw you balls, but, um, I I had a conversation with my friend, Chris Vasami about this exact same thing. It's like, how about we expand that zone, especially in like fall ball? Like, are you kidding? We should not be walking (laughs) like that much. Like we should test our limits right now. We should, um, really kind of like, just get used to the zone and like, maybe you go hard for that pitch. That's, you know, three inches off the plate and you do barrel it up. Cause you want it. Like you won't know until you are aggressive. Yeah. And it, even in AU, like there was a, a, a quote going around or like a stat line going around from the announcers, which obviously I don't get to watch the game because I'm playing in it, but mm-hmm. They would say, you know, Vidalis loves swinging at that first pitch. And I'm like, do I? I? <laughs> I'm like, I do. And then I had to like go back in, in my head and be like, oh yeah, I do swing in a lot of first pitches, but it was because whenever I'm swinging at first pitches, I am, I'm in the zone, right? I'm feeling good. I'm seeing the ball well, but also it allows me to not think as much, right? I can go up there. I swing the first one. I either get a hit or I get out. There's literally no other options. So you're 50, 50 at this point, Mm -hmm. but it allows me to not get into a deep count to where I start stressing myself out of like, Oh my God, what is she going to throw me? Am I, am I going to strike out? Am I going to miss this ball? Am I going to dribble it to the pitcher? Like you start self-sabotaging in your head and it happens to everyone. If you, if it doesn't happen to you, I need to know your secrets, but, um, you don't allow yourself to strike out if you don't get in deep count. So I'm like, first pitch like I'm here to hit I'm ready to hit like Mm -hmm. that's gonna be the best pitch I'm ready I'm locked in I'm gonna swing set the tone I mean you go hard you completely miss it a ball but you swing hard like that pitcher's a little intimidated you know (laughs) like the and I want to go back and just say like walking is not a bad thing by no not at all but there's a time and a place right like there's there's nothing wrong with a great battle Mm -hmm. and like you end up walking but like Air on the side of aggressiveness. We talk about it all the time and you have to do this as a hitter. So I, situations that aren't high pressure. Yeah. You know, like yeah. fall ball scrimmages, all of these things. Why not test your limits? Because if you that ball that's three inches off. Now you have three more inches of plate coverage that you didn't know you had. Yeah. And now you can extend it two more inches. See how far you can test yourself off the plate because realistically, no one's going to throw you a ball down the middle of the plate unless it's a mistake, of course. And as you get older and older, the less sweet those pitches become Mm -hmm. when they're um, supposed to be there. And you can get better and better each year. The more you can cover here, the more they're going to have to start going here. Yeah. And the more they're focused on this, the more they miss here. By the way, for those who don't know what here is, she was saying side to side. So side to side, then they're going to have to start going up and down. They start going up and down. And a lot of times when you're younger, obviously I'm not a pitcher. So any pitchers feel free to correct me. But if my brain is thinking about, okay, I need to get this high enough so that she can't hit it. I'm not worried as much about like how much plate it's getting. I'm worried about get it high enough. So if your brain's focused on getting it high enough, you're probably going to leave it right over the middle of the plate. And if rise ball is your strength, boom, Mm -hmm. that's a hit right there. Yeah. And you just said it, the pitcher is now putting their thoughts on like what, what you are doing instead of like play to your strengths. This is like Mm -hmm. the whole reason why I asked you this question. Like you are so good at playing to your strengths. Like, yes, you didn't even know you go for that many first pitches, but that's because you know what you want early. Like, you know, that you are going to swing aggressive and you're going to do it from the get-go. Like that's your game. And everybody, I, 
if you're listening, I want you to think of like, what is your strength? Like, what is the thing that makes you unique? Because I've talked to so many hitters on this podcast and I've gotten different answers from every single hitter. So the more, you know, yourself, the more, you know, your strengths, the more you play to those strengths, the more successful you're going to be. Now, can I reverse the question and say, when you're not playing to your strengths or when things aren't going well, like what's going on in your brain and how do you get yourself out of it? I think for me, uh, this is actually very relevant because it just happened in AU, like, and post-college, I feel like I lost my swing a lot. And that was due to, you know, a lack of reps or as many reps as I was taking in college, because in college you're hitting like hundred hours balls a day, you know, and in, in post-college life pro, you're only training, like, you know, if you're lucky an hour a day, maybe an hour every two days, three days. So you're not getting as much time because you know, this whole life thing that we have to do too, it's kind of like, yeah. And you had a hitting coach and you had managers throwing you reps all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it was, I just lost my pattern of movement. And like I mentioned earlier is we know that our body knows what to do, but sometimes our brain starts to like interfere and tell us these things that, oh, I have to do this. I have to do this. Well, mine was not doing something that I was so used to doing that. So uh, for me, what I do is I wrap my back and it's always worked for me. And that's why my hands were so fast because my body naturally goes back away to kind of load up. And then when I unwind, I use my hips, but my, my, um, back and my shoulders are rotating so fast that I'm like whipping through the zone. So if mm-hmm. you take a picture of my bat, it's, it disappears like yeah. back here around my shoulder. So mm-hmm. when I wasn't on, I think one of the things that caused me to lose a little bit of that was I was using a one piece bat. So, you know, when you move to pro, they have a pro bat, they have a college bat, and then they have like ASA bat. I don't even know what it is, but so, you know, there's different levels. So when you graduate, I'm like walking in with my little, um, I don't even remember what was it Rawlings at the time from college. So I'm like walking in with my little Rawlings and all these girls are grown women. I should say are launching these balls. And I'm like, is the ball going to do that for me? Like, I don't know. We're, we're going to see. So I start hitting the ball and I realized, oh my gosh, this ball is not going anywhere. Are these dead? Are these waterlogged? Like I was like blaming the balls. I'm like, this cannot be right. And the girls start telling me, you know, are you using a college bat or are you using a pro bat? And I'm like, what do you mean a pro bat? Like, I didn't know these things existed. Yeah. Like, yeah I have to get a pro bat. And I was like, okay. So I figure out how to get a pro bat and the ball is jumping <laughs> off of this bat. Let me tell you but it was a one piece and the one piece has a lot less flexion in the middle half of the bat from where the grip is connected to the barrel. Um, so if it's all one piece for me, it doesn't get as much like whip and flexibility through that zone. So it kind of took away the speed of my hands. So for about a year and a half, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was like, okay, my hips are right my timing's on, I'm choosing good pitches. Why do I feel like I'm getting jammed on the inner half? Because the inner half is my jam. Like if you throw it in the inner half, it's going over the fence. Mm-hmm. And I was getting stuck and stuck. I was hitting dribblers to third baseman. You know, I was trying to open my stance a little bit so I could give myself room to get through. And me and my dad went back after one of our tournaments with Mexico and we were like what is going on so we watched some of my old film and he was like you know something that you always did that you haven't been doing lately and I was like no what like I'm like I know everything and he's like you used to wrap your barrel around and I almost have like a little bit of a hitch whenever I load because my foot comes down but my arm is still moving backwards to create that whip. And when I was using the one piece, I didn't have as much flexion. So my bat was having to come out and around the ball instead of turning and getting my hands inside the ball and through the ball. Mm. So when, when I changed to a two piece bat, I felt so fast through the zone. And it was like, my swing just like clicked back to where it was in college. And I was like, Oh, what? 
guess like, who's back I'm like are you kidding me like that's the whole the whole like almost two years I'm like that's what it was are you serious yeah and so I started doing that and the whole time I'm like telling myself I'm like maybe I shouldn't be a pro maybe I like shouldn't be doing all these things like maybe I shouldn't and then I'm like as soon as that happened I'm like why would I ever tell myself that because I was failing like my failure does not take away from everything I've already accomplished thus far in my life like I knew at it was like almost like the light at the end of the tunnel I knew that as long as I could get there everything else wouldn't matter like the journey I know is supposed to be really fun and like all of this stuff, embrace the journey, do like enjoy the process. Like sometimes the process sucks and that's okay, but it has to be that mental like strength pushing you through just like it would be for anything else. But like you can literally talk yourself in and out of a slump. And regardless of what people think, like slumps are real, slumps aren't real. Slumps are real because mentally you feel that and like it doesn't only stay up here. It becomes like your body language. It becomes you not being excited for after the game and hanging out with your friends and, you know, all of the social interactions. It starts to drain you. And at the end of the tunnel, you're like, why did I let myself get so upset over that? Because I didn't get a hit. Are you kidding me? Like, my parents still love me. My friends still love me. I'm still an incredible softball player. I've still done X, Y, and Z. And like, that's why I'm good. That's why I deserve to be here. But so often we think that the struggle defines us when at the end, like at the end of the day, it's what you got to, what was your end point? And like, you struggled through all of that so you could be here. And as a hitter, like you have to get better with every slump because each time you go through that, you realize like there's so much bigger things to be worried about other than what's my batting average right now Mm -hmm. what's my on base percentage so I feel like every time I go through a slump it gets shorter because I put into perspective what really matters and usually it's not getting hits that is not my success marker in life and it shouldn't be your success marker in life yes you have four years in college yes you want to be an all-american yes you want to be great but like at the end of the day, like you still have to go through your four years of college and experience it. And whether you're not an all American does not define that experience. Like you can still have fun and still be one of the greatest and not be an all American. Thank you. I needed to hear that. I was never that <laughs> period. Like that doesn't mean that like you were a terrible softball player. It's like, look at how many talented softball players there are in like NCAA alone. And that's not to mention yeah. like NAIA, JUCO, like all of these things, like the, these athletes are good, but that doesn't make you any less better. Yeah. It and makes you good men- also period. Yeah. You mentioned that last time. Cause you, you're a two-time all American mm-hmm. and the best year you had, you did not get all American. Oh, it was terrible for me. Like it was my worst year, but I would do it all over again. And like, people always say that. And like, I would trade my accolades for national championship. And at the end of the day, I would because Mm -hmm. regardless, I would have still done the same things. I would have still like made the same relationships. I would have probably had better relationships because I would have been struggling and I would have been like, please help me, please help me. But, you know, doing all of these things, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Like Mm -hmm. as long as we're healthy and we're happy and we have people that we love and that love us, like that's why I always like preach finding what you love outside of softball because at the end of the day like the cleats are going to come off and what are you going to have to show for it Mm -hmm. are you going to just like think about softball all day every day if you do that's awesome but there (laughs) are way more things in life there's places to experience people to meet like things to love and that's the beautiful thing is like we're doing this because we want to do it like because I love this game not because I want to be the best there ever was. And like, everyone remember me, would that be cool? Absolutely. But is that going to be my deciding factor of what I gave to the game? Absolutely not. It could never be. Yeah. So how much of like, what you've mentioned that you wanted to win a national championship, like four times already today, how much did that dictate how you trained from, let's just say from like a hitting perspective? Um, From hitting perspective, so we actually had a new hitting coach that came in my freshman year, Jerry Glasgow, 
And it was nice because we came in at the same time. So we kind of got to learn each other at the same pace. Like, okay, how is he teaching? How am I receiving? What like words or keywords work for me? Um, and he did a lot of things that I like didn't realize that I was good at. And so mm-hmm. it made me realize like, oh my God, I kind of do know what I'm talking about. Like um, we would do all sorts of machines. So we would do like screwball, curveball, change up. Eventually we got the one that like you, you load the sequence in already and then you just put the balls in and it changes each one. So if you're not there when they're programming it, you have no idea what's coming. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it was just, you know, going through um, practices, reading spins, reading the break of the ball, exaggerating things. So making the pitch like 80 miles an hour, or um, we, there was one point where he made these like boxes and put turf on top of them. And we stood on top of that platform and it was a big platform. So we had plenty of room, but it was a little scary. Um, so we would stand on the platform and he would have the machine on the ground and he would be trying to recreate Alexis Osorio's rise ball. It jumps so much when he was like, well, if we're already up there, like we're going to, if we can't, uh, if we can't not swing at it, we're going to learn how to hit it. So Mm -hmm. that's what we did. We practiced it. He would turn it up to like 80 miles an hour. And you're like, I know this sounds insane, but, um, we just learned how to hit it. I don't know. And we actually did see like some success over that, like those methods. And when we were training, I think more of it for me came off on like outside of softball, like more on like social side and all of that, because I knew what the end goal was, but I would say in softball, it wouldn't have made me work any less hard if I knew that I wasn't going to win because Mm -hmm. I don't regret anything that I did in college like I worked my butt off every day to not only make sure that I was getting better but also that like our team was getting better and like our communication was better or whatever it may be obviously there's some days like you're like having drama or whatever but it's so important to realize that like at the end of the day you all have one common goal Nobody wants to come and be like, no, I don't, I don't think I want to win a national championship. Like, man, I'm good. Everybody is there fighting for that goal. And I think you see it throughout the year. And that's why colleges work so hard is because they have this end goal. Whereas now pro, right. You don't have that end goal. The end goal is being the champion of the season. So I think the goals always change how hard you work. Should it? Yeah. Regardless if you meet the goal or not. It sounds like the secret sauce was though, training in an environment extreme like way harder than anything you'll ever face like so hard to where like you go against cesario and you're like oh this is easy you're like practice was so hard that is is legitimately what he said he wanted to happen like he was like i want you guys to come on the bus afterwards and be like that's it (laughs) yeah (laughs) well okay calm your horses i don't think we'll be saying that about her rise ball but anyways yeah. Uh, yeah. It just it's like extreme level of training with him. But then on the flip side, my senior year, we had a new coach come in. Um, coach Glasgow went to Auburn and then ULL. So he's at ULL now, but um, our coach Keith Stein came in and we had known him from, uh, you know, some of the summer camps he did. He played baseball at a you know, a lot of things that we had run into him over the course of our careers there. And he was very much like, whatever works for you works for you. Like, we're going to find your swing and make your swing the best that you can do. Never like, I want everyone to swing this one way, because that's kind of how Glasgow was on the other side. He wanted everyone to swing the same way to maximize power. And like people like me, who I already kind of swung the way that he wanted us to swing, it was a lot easier for me. But someone like one of my best friends, Erica Russell, who is 5'3", plays center field and is faster than most people, you know, she's not going to be as successful as someone like me who's like literally been training their whole life to get the ball in the air and out of the park. Whereas she's been training, you know, put the ball on the ground, run it out, put the ball in the gap, uh, like use your legs. So I think you saw a little bit um, more flourishing on that sense of like specific players doing a lot better when they were just being able to 
swing the way that they wanted to swing in a more efficient way rather mm-hmm. than all trying to swing one specific way. Yeah. And you're built different. So it requires yeah, everyone's different. Built different. We all have different swings, different mentalities, you know, it all factors in. Yeah. Okay. So I want to dive into like a typical BP session for yourself. Okay. You can go like now ish. I'm sure there are things in college that you still do, but like, do you have signature drills that you're doing every day? Um, if so, what are they? Like you introduced me to this toe tap drill, like when we were working for the package deal and I still have my players use it to this day. Cause it's so good about creating that strong and stiff back leg, um, that's ready to like launch. Um, but like what stuff are you doing? Um, and is it, is it something that like you specifically do? I'm sure people on your team don't do the exact same thing. Like, why did you choose this routine for yourself? Yeah, I actually have never been like a big drill person or a big, yeah. like, I'm going to do this drill to fix this. And like, we kind of talked about that, like growing up. Um, we had a cage in our backyard, which probably was the best thing my parents could ever do. Um, and my dad was my hitting coach and he gave lessons in the backyard. So I would kind of like jump in and be one of his lessons and we would just hit front toss for like the whole time because ever since I was younger, like we worked so specifically on the right mechanics of like the way your body like needs to move, right? Your hips go and then your shoulders and then your hands, all these things. So I didn't know how to pull a ball until well into like two, three years of a softball because my dad knew that I was such a strong kid. And especially being that age, he was like, I know she's strong and I know she can pull it. But I, he was like telling me essentially that he wanted to build my foundation of the swing before he let my body move the way that it wanted to. So we learned how to get inside the ball. I would hit everything to the right side. If you played a right side shift on me, you could probably get me out. And so one day he walked up to me, we were in our, uh, our world series of our 10 U team. Mm. Uh, don't go too crazy. But so he walked up to me, he said, okay, I know we've been working on this, but I want you to hit the ball as hard as you can right here. And I said, okay. And like not even thinking anything of it. And the next pitch I went up and my dad almost turned me around to be a slapper. Let that just be of note because that would have been very interesting as I got older. (laughs) So I go up to the plate and I hit the ball off the top of a fence that was 225 left center. And he looks, he literally stopped and he said he looked up at my mom and she looked down at him because he was like kind of down towards the dugout and they were both just like eyes wide open like mouths like oh okay maybe we're not going to switch her over to the left side (laughs) and um from that day on we really worked on um just seeing how the ball comes off the bat like okay what are certain things that you're doing that you're feeling um, how your your barrel is connecting with the ball. What positions are your hand in? What about your hips? Did you start early? Did you start late? And that's how I learned how to hit was seeing the ball off the bat. And like the ball will tell you everything that you're doing. You just have to know what it means, right? If the ball is slicing, it probably means you're pulling off of that outside pitch a little bit, right? If the ball is bouncing into the ground, it means you're on top of the ball. So learning these things from a young age, I feel like gave me such good, um, understanding of like what my body was doing the body awareness that it takes to be an elite hitter. And also like learning, you know, contact points, like simple things like, okay, what about if I try to hit this ball back here, if I try to hit it inside ball back here, what would it do? And like, my dad would ask me these questions and I would say, I don't know. And he'd be like, all right, try it. And so I would have to try it and fail so that I could actually learn how to do it right. And that has really carried over into my career as a whole. I'm a very quality over quantity person. I'm not the kind of girl that's going to sit there and hit four buckets. Just can't do it. One, I'll be out of breath. Two, I hit myself into bad habits. Mm. So I know that that is a thing for me. Like if I start getting tired and like, I'm done with the session, like my brain and my body like don't work together anymore. They just kind of do their own thing. 
and I'll start dropping my hands. I'll start, you know, having a big leg kick with, which I don't really, and I'm doing anything that I can to get my body through the training session. Whereas my mind has been checked out for like 20 minutes. So yeah, no one to stop. Yeah. So that is a big thing. I just, I literally just love front toss. So my dad and I will go, I'll stretch out my back a little bit because my back is such a main factor of my swing. I will, you know, throw my back in a circle, you know, give it a little arm swings and we'll hit on the tee. We'll do probably like 10, 12 balls inside, outside, uh, or we start middle, we go outside, inside. And then sometimes if we're feeling crazy, we'll do some high tee as well. And then we just throw front toss for like 30 minutes and we're like working. I tell him what I want to feel and like what I want to work on. And then he kind of just keeps an eye out, watches the ball, listens to the way the ball comes off the back. Cause that's also a big indicator. And from there we just work on it. And I keep notes in my phone of like, okay, last session I worked on this. How did I feel? Do I like want to keep doing this? And I can go back to it and revisit it that next time and be like, okay, so last week we worked on, um, you know, getting my foot down and my cues were, um, you know, stay on time or halfway home or something like that. That way, whenever that starts happening again, because it's inevitable, it's going to happen. It's muscle memory. He can say, Hey, halfway home. And I immediately know what that means. And I, I know how to fix it and I can make my body do it as well as my mind. What does that mean? What is this happening? What does halfway home mean? Um, like when the ball's halfway home, your foot and your get your it down heel should be down. Got so it. That is like a good measure of like knowing if I'm on time or I if I'm it. behind or if I'm early from reaching. So, wow. It sounds like just like staying curious yeah, and understanding is. your body and what it does. Like these are, it, it's so funny. Cause like, I expected to talk about drills and you're like, no, it's about feel. And it, it truly isn't. It's funny. Cause like you, sometimes I listen to MLB players, like post-game interviews. Cause like they're everywhere. And like, I'm thinking of Chris Bryant right now or Chris Bryant. Oh my God. <laughs> Bryce Harper, Bryce <laughs> not Harper. Chris Bryant. <laughs> and I know, and I know he plays for the Phillies and you're an Astros fan, but I mean, he had that super clutch home run to put them up by one in the final game to get them to the world series. And I listened to his interview and he said, um, I wasn't trying to do too much in that situation. He's like, the guy on first is fast. I was trying to hit it to the opposite gap. And that was his plan. And what does he do? He rocks it to the opposite gap, but like way in the stands. Yeah. And it's a home run and they win the game and they're now at the world series. But like it had, like, if you don't know your swing and you don't know what that ball that you're trying to make happen feels like you can't recreate it. Yeah. And so it also, sounds like your training is just recreating good feeling. Yes. The, the feeling aspect of it, like when you're tense and when you're tight, there's no way you're going to hit a home run. Like no way because your body, like your muscles work so much better. And like your, your torque works better. Your breathing is better when you're relaxed. The moment you start to tense up, like if you've ever been in a home run derby contest, right? The point mm-hmm. is to get it out. And everyone gets so tight and rolls over, hits the ball to shortstop or is lifting the ball so high in the the center field and nothing goes over. It's because you're tense, your muscles are tight. You're not giving yourself the same range of motion that you would have when you're calm. You're just having a smooth swing. We always would say smooth swing is a fast swing. Mm -hmm. And that's so true because you can't swing fast if you're not smooth, but you can swing fast when you are. Yeah. Okay. So you have a few minutes before you have this call, but remind people where they can find you to, um, obviously I would say if you haven't listened to the first episode of Tori, go listen, because we talk about so many other things, you know, just like your Olympic story and, you know, finding who you are outside of softball. I think those are such good points. Um, so if you love Tori, go listen to that, but you love hanging out on Instagram, right? Yeah, I would say Instagram is my main like platform that I post a lot on. If you think I'm crazy, I'm probably more crazy on my Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, feel free. <laughs> but um, all my socials are at Vidalis Tori. So you can find me TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. I'm, I'm, I'm all over socials. I love it. Send I love your groupie self on socials. So yes, go follow Tor. 
Um, you got a minute for five to thrive? Of course. All right. Let's do this. These are different questions than last time. Okay. I get there. They might be harder. They might be easier. I don't know. Um, the first one's easy. Astros or Phillies? (laughs) Astros. And if you're a hater and you hate the Astros, that sounds like a personal problem. (laughs) Well, I mean, they did get caught cheating. So like, if you're a real baseball fan, you know, every team is like essentially doing the same thing. And they're right. They got caught. You're not wrong. The Yankees got caught too, but they swept it under the rug. Just saying. (laughs) All right. I just wanted to know how you felt about that. (laughs) Do you have a favorite college memory? College memory, probably the 2017 super regional when we won at Tennessee to go to the world series, probably like top 10 moments of actually like top five moments of my entire life. So much fun. Everything paid off. It was amazing. So cool. So cool. Uh, you're super into makeup. What's your favorite makeup product right now? Right now, honestly, I'm loving mascara because (laughs) I had lash extensions for a little while while I was on TV because it was a little bit easier. And I, my poor lashes, they were so bad. They looked like a little baby chicken. Like it was, <laughs> it was really bad. And so I bought this eyelash serum and I've been using it. And I told Kendall, my roommate the other day, I was like, do my lashes look kind of long? And she's like, actually they do. Cause her lashes are really long. And so I was like, oh my God, I'm looking like you. So I've been like putting just like a tad bit of mascara on. And I feel like it just looks like so chic. I'm sorry. When you said baby chicken, I lost everything it, after that. It literally, I looked like, imagine a baby chicken coming out of the egg and just being like so disoriented, not knowing how to walk. That was like what my eyelashes were giving in that moment. Just like <laughs> hair everywhere is, no, it was bad. Okay. So we're into lashes. All right. Who is your favorite hitter besides yourself? Ooh, that's a good one. Oh my god. Thank you favorite hitter besides myself um I would say favorite like person to watch probably Jesse Warren like she Mm. is so such a bad ball hitter I've never seen anyone hit balls out of the zone as hard as she does and it's actually amazing to watch like I'm at first base and I'm like okay yeah she like throws her barrel and it goes over over the fence I literally refer to her a lot in my lessons because, you know, some of the best hits we ever have are so dysfunctional. Like the swing is just crap, but she, I'm not saying she has a crappy swing, but she, when you say she throws her barrel, like there are times where I think it was in the world series, like low and out pitch. She just kind of like chucks her barrel at it. Sticks her butt out and just, and just, it goes. And you're just like, how how easy the swing is. Like we make it. Yeah, we do. We make it so complicated. Yeah. we do. Oh, okay. Sure. Last question. What would you tell a hitter who's currently in a slump right now? What should she do? Don't base your success on the outcome of the play. Mm. So you could barrel up a ball and have the best hit that you've had in three weeks and it goes right to someone and you still feel like you're in that slump. If you're like barreling up balls there's no way that you should go to the dugout ever and feel bad about yourself or feel bad about what could I have done you did everything you needed to do you hit the ball hard you hit the ball like you were on time all of these things have to line up for it to come off the barrel that fast you just happen to hit it to someone who was standing in the right place so um biggest thing is just keep swinging keep swinging and don't rely on a hit in the book to tell you that you're a good hitter you have to believe that you're a good hitter and you have to just keep swinging and not let it affect you so much to where you start to hate the game because I've seen that happen a lot like people start to say I hate softball I want to quit because they can't get a hit but the more fun thing is staying in it saying how powerful your mind can become when you start to use it in a way that benefits you instead of against you Boom. Mic drop. That was such an incredible answer. You're an incredible human. I love you so much. I love you. I love talking softball with you. You're the best. Um, very long winded too. What'd you say? I said, I'm very long winded too. Yeah, but for a good reason. (laughs) It makes it. I think your family's going to enjoy this episode listening to it. Oh yeah.
shout out mom because they're the first ones to listen to every episode you are on so that let's go true. yeah if all you right believe, you try to beat them to it well i love you so much um thank you so much for coming on again you're you're the goat for a reason oh, I appreciate you. you're too sweet to me thank you so much love you lots and i'll talk to you soon hopefully yes please